2018 has been an interesting year for games, and in the shuffle of landmark single player releases making a comeback, and a series of massive controversies, a lot of really awesome games didn't get the attention they deserved. For those who don't know, last year I did a video all about 20 interesting games you might have missed over the year, and I thought I'd do it again. This video is focusing on cool, smaller games first and foremost, not necessarily good games you already know about and have probably played already, like the Cowboy one, the one that tried to be Minecraft and then tried to be a Minecraft custom map, or the game that will one day kill Masahiro Sakurai. This list is in no particular order for the most part, and with the exception of one, these games are playable primarily on PC, because that's just where I play most of my games. Well, without any further ado, on with the list. How's about we start with... Smoke and Sacrifice. Smoke and Sacrifice is a curious breed of survival game, that being one that doesn't market itself on spookiness, multiplayer action or even difficulty, but a story. If you've played something like Don't Starve, you'll pick up on the meat of this game fine, but nothing will prepare you for this weird, twisted world the grieving mother Sachi must venture through to find her child. This includes mind-altering smoke, crazy cults, and even deadly mutant Pikachus. There's a surprising amount of game here and a lot of really interesting ways you can interact with the environment, like gas bombs and these mines, that create a world that feels refreshingly alive. Smoke and Sacrifice is, deep down, pretty familiar light survival action RPG fare, but it's delivered in a way that really sets it apart, and that deserves a look. There's a part of me that really wants to dislike JRPGs. They're a genre that hasn't really evolved very much in the past decade, there's all sorts of outdated conventions and vestigial bits that get arbitrarily included, and they're all really, really long. So why is it that I love Heartbeat so much? Well, it's how the game takes antique ideas, gives them a new coat of paint, and gives a very old kind of game a much needed modernisation without ruining what makes it fun in the first place. Heartbeat is slick. It's got battles that are measured in seconds, not minutes, the writing is snappy and fun, and the game manages to pay just enough of an homage to the RPG greats like Pokemon and Earthbound, while still having an identity of its own, and more than enough cool ideas like a fully customisable party member. Heartbeat is great and well worth your time if you want to restore some faith in traditional RPGs. Minute, surprisingly, is very much a reimagining of the original Legend of Zelda. Except instead of running around a confusing grid bombing rocks, you've got one minute at a time to pick apart and master an ever-expanding world map to unlock shortcuts, solve puzzles, and fight baddies. When the minute is up, you die, and it's time to start over. The minute-long loop of gradual exploration is really compelling, with the game constantly throwing new ways to stretch your time at you or dangling new challenges just out of reach. While the game isn't very long, clocking in at about 180 lives, it's just bursting with inventive ideas and quirks that never outstay their welcome and were constantly finding new ways to surprise me. Making a dating game is really hard work. You've got to make the characters likeable, you need some nice art, and of course you need to let players buy a baggie of cocaine in order to make themselves more charming. Or is that just Monster Prom? Monster Prom is a love letter to trashy romance games, and it expresses that love in the form of a kind of well-meaning insanity. The game is rude, crude, and is full of radical dudes. Needless to say, the writing is, uh, pretty meme -y? but underneath that there are some solid jokes and great characters like the marriage-obsessed prince, who are made all the funnier thanks to the multiplayer nature of the game. It's not going to win any Pulitzers anytime soon, but Monster Prom is a very unique way to spend an hour or so with friends that has way more quality content than it ought to. Do give it a look. Prismata is the mutant degenerate offspring of Magic the Gathering and Starcraft. Each match sees two players given a random menu of robots to choose from and get told to blow each other up. Prismata is a game for people who love maths. Each build order and robot is balanced on a knife's edge of statistics and efficiency, and the game is all about eking out tiny advantages over your opponent and slowly crushing them with an army of laser monkeys. I'm absolutely awful at it, but the fully-fledged campaign is pretty fun for people who like puzzles more than they do cold, slow mathematical annihilation. Prismata is absolutely not for everyone, but there's a small subset of people out there, who are probably also really into collecting stamps, that will find this to be their next and much more fun addiction. Overcooked 2 Now, it might not look it, but this game is the best simulation of working in a kitchen that video games have to offer. The premise is simple. You've got to chop veggies, fry meats, and prepare meals in a kitchen in order to get orders out on time. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? The reality is that this basic setup quickly devolves into a frantic screaming match between you and your team as you try to keep the kitchen from burning down around you. It's a 
complete logistical nightmare that only gets crazier and better with more people playing. Oh, also, the plot, such as it exists, is centred around defeating an army of zombie, flower and yeast based creatures called the Unbred. Yeah, it's that kind of game. Which is to say, a brilliant one. Have you ever wanted to turn into an awful despot whilst masquerading as a saviour? Well, Frostpunk is your answer. The aim of the game is to use your charisma, big book of laws and complete authority of your dirty cockney slate, I mean citizens, to save what's left of humanity. Frostpunk is a surprisingly complex management game in a fantastically well realised setting with a bunch of cool stories to tell spread over multiple depressing campaigns for you to conquer. The morality systems it toys with sure as hell aren't perfect, with the message of adversity turning us into monsters being neutered a bit by the fact you don't need to go evil at all, but the grim, steampunky theme, as well as the great minimalist writing, create a really compelling experience regardless. Florence is a fascinating game and the only one on this list not playable on PC. The game is presented as a digital comic strip made up of WarioWare style micro games, like this bit where our main character Florence is on her first date, represented by an awkward puzzle that gets easier and easier the more time you devote to it. The game doesn't really shatter many boundaries, but it's a great blueprint for an intertwining of comics and games at some point in the future, and a brilliant example of the kind of verisimilitude video games are capable of. Do not sleep on Florence. Seriously, in five years, this will be the progenitor of an entire genre, mark my words. Hey, remember Undertale? Yeah, it was pretty good, right? So much so that some sort of talentless hack has decided to rip it off in the form of Deltarune. I mean, the blatancy of this clone is unreal. Look at the main character, huh? Seem familiar? And they've even stolen Undertale's whole plot, it's ridiculous. Yes, I suppose the writing is just as on point and hilarious as it is in the real thing, I guess the combat still manages to both subvert RPG tropes whilst also improving upon them, and if pushed you'll get me to admit that the main battle theme is a fucking banger. But honestly, the bloody cheek of it. This Toby Fox character ought to be ashamed of themselves, it makes my blood boil, it really does. There are a lot of games that use violence as a way to tell a story, and there's nothing wrong with that. But Wonder Song is really refreshing in its commitment to pacifism. Every problem in the game is solved with singing, and this leads to some really cool puzzle mechanics and some fun twists on existing RPG tropes and formulas, without ever really feeling gimmicky. Wonder Song is just fucking adorable, I mean, just look at this guy's face, huh? Can you turn it down? I sure as hell couldn't. I'm a sucker for cyberpunk. What can I say? I love me some thought-provoking techno-grime, and that's exactly what the Red Strings Club provides. You play as a barman who's got to help people out and find out their secrets using his magic booze powers. Not exactly a philosophical masterstroke, but that's because there's so much more waiting underneath the surface that I can't spoil. The game goes to some pretty freaking dark places, but expertly balances that with a quite hopeful, funny look on some depressing subject matter. Red Strings has plenty of great twists and turns, and ends on some really quite profound stuff. The game isn't perfect though, particularly in the final third which is plodding and more than a bit problematic, but that doesn't do much to dampen one of the smartest games of this year. Go play it. We're beginning to reach that point where the general gaming public is getting a bit sick of roguelikes. They're basically everywhere nowadays, so it takes a really special one to get my attention. Dead Cells is that game. It expertly weaves together roguelike progression systems, the thrill of metroidvania exploration, and the meatiest, crunchiest, feel-goodness combat system I've played within a while. Dead Cells maintains the hard-as-nails design of most roguelikes, but smartly trims off the grind and repetition by adding cool speedrunning challenges into earlier levels, keeping things nice and fresh. To top it all off, the game has a brilliant sense of humour that adds some much-needed levity to the otherwise pretty bleak setting. It's easily the best roguelike of the year. Do give it a shot. If there was one game I'm going to get the most flack for including, it will probably be this one. Because if you're not in the right mindset, Cultist Simulator is just hours of putting rectangles in boxes, and it isn't very fun. But if you can sit down for a few hours and really immerse yourself in the spooky world it gradually conjures, then you'll be able to experience a story unlike any other. Cultist Simulator is the mind baby of Alexis Kennedy, the person who helped to bring the twisted world of fallen London into our reality, and it shows. The story of Cultist Simulator is oozing with atmosphere and secrets that give you just enough breadcrumbs to follow in a gripping journey that seems to drag you ever deeper. Next up, Eternal. Now, this is a game you might recognise from the background of my videos when there's nothing more relevant to put down, and it's finally been released from beta, which means I get to talk about it properly. 
I love the game because it's one of the only digital CCGs which I think uses the medium to its fullest potential. This can be stuff like outright duplicating cards, having an extra pool of stuff to draw on mid-match that isn't in your deck, and also the ability to overwhelm your opponent with an army of infinitely duplicated robot cockroaches that all make each other stronger. The game also has a really generous free-to-play model, and it's well worth a look for people too poor to play Magic and with too much taste to play Hearthstone. The Hex is another game from Daniel Mullen, the creator of cult hit Pony Island, and is more of the same really, which is a good thing. The Hex is obstinately about you figuring out which of six down-on-their-luck video game characters committed a murder, but things are never that simple. Instead, what we get is a metafictional adventure detailing the rise and fall of these heroes and a real ending hidden behind an insane amount of fourth wall breaking puzzles. The game is smartly written, deeply incisive into modern consumer culture, as well as taking a well deserved stab at auteur indies. The Hex is very much a game of its time and has never been more relevant. So go pick it up now. Thalassophobia is defined as a fear of the sea. If you have it, you'll want to stay the hell away from Subnautica, and if you don't, you soon will. Subnautica starts off looking like a classic open world survival game, but this time with an underwater gimmick. However, it's actually a highly directed experience, with a world that's deliberately crafted to guide you to the right places and have interesting things for you to do in every possible direction. It's also got a real commitment to scaring the pants off of you. Subnautica's leviathans are among the scariest monsters in any game I've ever played, and the rest of the game feeds into that feeling of vast, beautiful emptiness with gorgeous visuals and well-paced survival mechanics with a lot of depth. Depth? Huh? Huh? Fine, alright, moving on. Bad North is one of the quite few games to come out recently that attempts to distill the RTS genre down into its basest essentials, and it's easily one of the most successful. The meat of Bad North is in defending curiously square-shaped, randomly generated islands from hordes of rampaging vikings using nothing more than a few bands of dudes and your wits. It really does take the visceral moment-to-moment -moment strategy of something like Total War, with charges, choke points and chopping with swords, and somehow condenses it all into bite-sized tactical chunks that never cease to be entertaining. Ace. Right, that's 17 games you should have played in no particular order, but they're just the starter. Now it's time for the top 3. First up, Hitman 2. Oh, IO Interactive, you sweet, beautiful children. Basically, the only games you make are Hitman games, and they're so good, but publishers don't seem to get that. Seriously, if you've not heard me crowing about Hitman yet, it's an amazing open world puzzle game series about killing people in cool ways and turning a whole level into a weapon using nothing but your wits and an attention to detail. In a mission in Mumbai, your target is meeting up with his wife for drinks. Which, as any good Hitman player knows, is an invitation for a poisoning. But there's no obvious way to tell whose drink is whose, and killing an innocent means your score takes a big hit. That means you've got to be observant, spot that the wife is a smoker, and then poison the drink furthest away from the ashtray. It's little moments like that where Hitman 2 lets you feel like a genius that the game really shines. Needless to say, these games are absolutely awesome, and Hitman 2 might be the best of the bunch. It takes the fantastic level design sensibilities of the previous game and mixes in some more exotic locales, a dash of literally killer black comedy, and a whole collection of user-made content. What's not to like? The Return of the Obra Dinn is often billed as a deduction game. The people that say this are wrong and dumb, it's an induction game. That means that rather than working out what happened, you've got to put together the pieces to work out why things happened the way they did. Oberdin does this by giving you an old-timey ship to run around on and 60 different crew members to perform a post-mortem on. You've got to use environmental clues, voice snippets and your ship's roster to work out who died, how, and by whose hands. There's even a bit where you can compare people's shoes. Now if that doesn't make it a worthy inclusion on anyone's list, I don't know what's wrong with you. Now, if you were one of the elite, beautiful geniuses who watched last year's vid, then you'll know that 2017's best game you should have played was Nier Automata, so you might think I'd go for another arty story game this year too. Not so. This year's game you really owe it to yourself to check out is… Into the Breach. This game is easily in the top 5 strategy games I've ever played, and it's because it's got this perfect balance of tactics and randomness. There's just enough randomization and chance in Into the Breach to make each and every playthrough unique and challenging, but without making you feel like the game is unwinnable at any point. This is helped by the crystal clear UI and the ability to totally reset your turn once per mission, giving you some much needed leeway, but without letting you get away with totally screwing up. 
The simple foundation of big robots that punch even bigger aliens is easy to grasp and control, but that gradually opens up like a beautiful onion or parfait depending on preference to a real layers of strategic depth. First, you can learn that taking damage on your own mechs to save a building can be the right play, then you can understand that bumping Vex out of the way rather than killing them can be more effective in the long run. That lets you understand that often, the Vex themselves are a more effective weapon than anything your mechs can do alone. Every system in the game is like this. It appears to be simple, but hides a wealth of complexity in the strata below the surface. Into the Breach is challenging without being unfair, replayable while still feeling directed and well paced, and offers multiple different strategies without one being obviously broken. It's a masterstroke not just in overall design, but in restraint. Everything exists for a reason, and it all works to serve the simple but deep strategic core. Even if you've never played a strategy game and are too much of a pacifist to ever even think about squishing a giant space bug, give it Into the Breach a go. I promise it'll change your mind, and devour about 50 hours of your time in the process. So there we have it, 20 games you should have played from 2018. If you like the look of any of them, please do check them out. It's been a hell of a year for interesting games, and also for the channel as well. Since the last time I did one of these, the channel has grown from less than 500 subs to 85,000. Holy crap. Thank you so much to everyone who supported The Architect of Games over the last year. It's insane to see how much things have grown in such a short time. Even if all you've done is watch a couple of videos, your support has been instrumental in getting the channel to where it is today. Cheers. Seriously. And of course, what kind of video would this be if I didn't give a shout out to my top tier supporters on Patreon? Who are Samuel Vanderplatz, Lucas Slack, William Johansson, Ray's Dad, Jonathan Kirkinson, Joshua Binswanger, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Patrick Romberg, Alex DeLoch, Baxter Heel, Strateger in Ultima, Lunar Eagle 1996, Daniel Metges, Asaran, Brian Natariani, and Chow. The Patreon has been a huge success over the past few months, thank you to everyone who's generously decided to donate to the channel, and of course, to you two for even listening to this spiel. I know I do it every video, but it's important to give a shout out to the people who actually give me money, rather than just give me views. Uh, not to say that you're not important. Oh, I'm, I'm rambling now. Okay, just have a nice 2019. Go on, go on, get out of here. Piss off.